Well, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you are in the United States uh, or beyond. My name is Garrett Schmidt, and I am the managing editor for BBC Exhibit Hall. And I'd like to welcome you all to today's live panel discussion uh, hosted by Care Journey, and it is called Accelerating Insights in Value-Based Care. We've got a lot of great material uh, to cover today. We've got some really exciting panelists, um, which I'll tell you about in just a moment. A few items of note before we get started. Everyone is joined today in listen-only mode, traditional webinar format, so we can't see you or hear you, uh, which is okay, but we do want to hear from you, and uh, we will have a Q&A time towards the end uh, where we will answer audience questions, and uh, so please ask your question at any time. You don't have to wait until then in order to ask your question. You can ask it at any, any time using your control module. There's actually a place for questions there which is different than the chat. So make sure you ask your question there. Uh, and then finally, uh, today's webinar is being recorded. And so you'll have the opportunity to rewatch the session and or share it with colleagues. Uh, we hope that you do so. So I'm gonna be sending everyone a webinar uh, towards the, I'm sorry, a webinar link to the webinar uh, after we're done. And you'll be able to rewatch it there or download the slides and share it with, with, with folks. And we hope that you do. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are going to have a, a question that we're going to ask you towards the end. Uh, and the answer to that question, um, is, you'll have you'll respond in the little in the actual questions mark rather than the chat. Uh, so everything's going to happen in the questions module, and we'll explain more uh, when we get to that question towards the end. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to now hand it over to Dr. Katherine Schneider, and she is the former CEO of DVACO the former chair of NACOS and current Care Journey advisor. She's also an independent con or consultant to, to Canoes Health, and I'm sure she'll uh, go over a little bit more of her background uh, now. So welcome, uh, Dr. Schneider, and she will introduce our other speakers. Thank you, Garrett. Really thrilled to be here today. As uh, some of you may have seen on LinkedIn, I was so excited about this conversation because I've spent uh, you know, well over two decades struggling to sort of figure out how can I get the most actionable insights that I need when I have claims data that may be broad and standardized and are kind of shallow, but are like way stale and old, particularly from a clinical point of view versus clinical data, which may be like deep, but narrow and unstandardized. And so I'm really excited about this recent development. Um, that we are uh, getting from CMS and other payers to, to really help solve some of those problems. So um, next slide, please. Today we have a fantastic panel um, and I wanna introduce our panelists. I'm gonna then let them each tell a little bit about their organizations and then we're gonna start to dive in on really how do we accelerate insight with some of the new tools that are out there. So first we have Jennifer Ravener, uh, Jennifer's Chief Product Officer of Pearl Health, which she'll tell you about. Um, prior to Pearl, she was a product leader at Athena and Hint Health, and she has done all kinds of things in value-based care, both on the health system side and independent providers, direct primary care. She's been a consultant, she's worked with pharma, um, so really fantastic broad view of the whole healthcare ecosystem. Um, and Jennifer has a Master of Healthcare Administration from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a BA in social welfare from UC Berkeley. Next, we have John Supra, who is the Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Upstream. Prior to going to Upstream, John served in numerous leadership roles um, in many different kinds of organizations, very much focusing on population health and health informatics, including being the Chief Data Officer at Prisma Health, the CIO at the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and the Executive Director of Health IT at Clemson. And John holds two degrees in aerospace engineering from the University of Colorado, which just is the perfect layup to talk about, is this really rocket science or not? Um, and so our next panelist is one of my favorite people at Care Journey, Zach Bradle, who is also an engineer in biomedic uh, biomechanical engineering from Hopkins uh, as his degree. But J Zach is the director of product management at Care Journey, and he's been very specifically focused on value-based care. 
He's worked in many departments at Care Journey, including analytics, sales, and services. And uh, prior to coming to Care Journey, Zach was a data scientist for Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, Zach, actually, I did not know this before the webinar. Fun fact, he, his uh, passion for healthcare analytics and entrepreneurship began when he co-founded StrokeFlow, a mobile app designed to improve stroke outcomes by assisting stroke centers in data management. So he's been deep in the weeds on sort of workflow and, and uh, you know, the importance of timely information. So um, with the, those brief introductions, I'd like to start by asking Jennifer to introduce Pearl. Tell us about Pearl. Sure, thank you so much for the kind introduction. So Pearl Health is a technology-enabled uh, physician VBC enablement platform, essentially. So we help providers navigate and be successful in value-based care with a tech-first approach. Uh, we uh, were founded in 2020, starting in traditional Medicare and uh, moving into Medicare Advantage as we move forward in 2024. Great. John, tell us about Upstream and the care model there. Great. Well, I think I've got to take you up on your first question about does it take a rocket science and scientist? And I'm not sure to that answer, but it definitely feels that way some days. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I think the idea of delivering, as Jennifer said, technology assisted or supported models to providers is what Upstream is about as well. Um, Upstream supports primary care providers and their practices. We are sharing risk on over 140,000 lives in um, both ACO REACH programs and Medicare Advantage programs and supporting over 1,000 providers and their practice teams and most importantly, their patients and those that care for them in the Southeast. Um, we bring a care model where we embed a team with the practices to support them and we um, move the financial program through our gap Q to reward excellence at the time it happens while we take risk for those long shared savings models. And we support, as we'll talk about today, all of that with technology. Great. Zach, over to you to tell us about Care Journey. And then after you do that, I want to, uh, you can jump right in. And I will just say, Zach came to me a couple months ago and said, you know, let's talk about this BCDA thing and like, where, where can it really add value? And at first I was like, oh wow, like fast information. That's so exciting for all kinds of reasons. But then my head started to explode when I thought about, well, you know, I was had a million questions and Zach did a great job of patiently walking me through like how it all works and, you know, data deduplication and where does it go and how do you get it and how does it differ from CCLFs and the CCLFs go away in any way. So Zach, I'm gonna hand it over to you to tell us about Care Journey and then dive right in. Yeah, thank you so much. And I'm you know thrilled to be a part of this conversation with a couple of great panelists today. Um, I'll keep the Care Journey intro brief since I think many of you on the webinar already know uh, kind of generally what Care Journey does, but we view ourselves as a leader in, in, in claims-based analytics. Um, so we have access to a large swath of national claims data sets, as well as for years have done uh, analyses off of uh, CCLF files, which we'll get into later, which a lot of our uh, ACO reach and, and MSSP clients have had access to recently. Um, you can see kind of on the slide here how, how that is a huge part of our membership base of our customers. Um, and a reason why we are super excited about the enhancements that CMS is making with uh, BCDA in general. Um, so to kind of set the stage for for the topic and explain to everyone what is BCDA, what's the difference from what has been, you know, what ha people have had access to in the past. Um, BCDA stands for the Beneficiary Claims Data API, um, and is basically a way for uh, entities such as MSSP, ACO Reach, and actually kidney care entities under the KCC model to access uh, full patient uh, claims data of their attributed and sometimes assignable patients um, through an API. So this isn't necessarily uh, different information that was available before. Um, many of you on this call, I'm sure, are familiar with CCLF's uh, claim and claim line feed. Um, this is something that has been around for years, I think, from the inception of the MSSP model, maybe even before that. Uh, a lot of you on this probably sympathize with working with these series of CSV files that CMS sends every month, and then maybe you need to uh, 
you know, pull down, put in your processing workflow, uh, maybe CMS changed a column here or there and it messes with it, then you need to go back and start from scratch. Um, so one, the, the CSPs have always been generally uh, a bit difficult to work with. Um, and two, um, and probably most importantly, uh, they've been on a pretty decent lag. So you know, generally you're getting a CCLF file uh, roughly a month and a half after the claim has already occurred. Now this is helpful for you know still doing some retrospective performance and financial analysis, um, but it really leaves you uh, kind of no area to do anything sort of uh, operational on top of that data or or anything a little bit more reactionary uh, to kind of help the care coordination, care navigation, uh, flow of care. Um, so BCDA uh, really improves the timeliness of data specifically. Um, and there are two different flavors of BCDA. So one is fully adjudicated, meaning it's gone through the, the full adjudication process. You know what has been paid by CMS. This has actually been around for a year or two, uh, but um, you know the uh, delay uh, for that is specifically around 14 days for the fastest it can be. Um, what's really got people excited is, is recently, and it was about mid-May, so about two months ago, CMS announced their full production release of pre-adjudicated claims. Now, right now, this is only available to ACO REACH customers, but our ACO REACH participants, but uh, the, the hope is that, you know, eventually expands to, to other parts of fee-for-service and beyond. Uh, but this piece al allows people to receive claims uh, in, in a two to four day lag from submission, uh, which really opens up the potential of, of operations as, as we're gonna get into uh, and talk about a bit. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the next slide here uh, and kind of preview uh, a couple of use cases that we want to get into in more depth. Um, these are things that really weren't available or weren't available to, to uh, access under CCLF or even uh, a bit of the adjudicated uh, BCDA claims, but uh, the first of which is care coordination. So um, really we want to be able to use this BCDA data to uh, uh, basically influence a, a care pathway of, of an individual patient. Um, so this allows us to basically get notified that maybe an event occurred, maybe a patient was in the ED, maybe a patient has a new diagnosis, maybe they're seeing a certain specialist that you didn't expect them to see. And basically it allows you to intervene and potentially affect that pathway um, downstream. Another example of use case that this could address is, is definitely care gap closure. Um, so with this tight lag, it really allows you to pull a prioritized list of patients who uh, maybe have a specific gap, be that uh, a certain type of screening, be that an HCC that they haven't yet been coded with. Um, and whenever you provide such a list to a care manager or physician, you're gonna really instill confidence in them because it's gonna be very accurate. Whereas in the past, you may have provided them a list that is actually uh, you know, outdated by now and, and uh, you know, patients have gone through such care that you may be recommending. And then the last use case that, that we'll talk about today, well, maybe not the last, we may go beyond these three, uh, but the last one that we at least have planned is, is financial forecasting. So uh, with this kind of uh, early information that we're given through BCDA, we're able to do things like maybe identify the triggers of certain uh, either chronic or acute episodes that may occur, and then use uh, specific benchmarks that we've obtained from previous data or from national data sets to basically estimate uh, you know, what is going to be the, the downstream cost from those triggers helps you kind of get a, a um, you know, earlier start on any strategic decisions that you may need to make rather than waiting you know, 45 days down the line. So um, brief overview, uh, you know, definitely ask questions about each of those, but we're going to get into them pretty, pretty detailed uh, here, here shortly. Yeah, and to that point, we will have time for questions at the end. And for those who have uh, joined a few minutes late, please use the questions box on the uh, the GoToWebinar app um, to enter your questions. And I'm gonna keep an eye on those. And again, we'll try to get to as many as possible at the end, um, or maybe even in between, if it's uh, relevant to something that was just said that needs clarification. So, um, okay, so we're gonna dive in and talk about some, uh, some of these use cases in a little more detail. And we'll have our panelists talk about 
what they're either actually doing or planning to do. And, you know, it's always really important. There's, you know, there's theory and then there's actual real life practice. Um, and so I am so excited to hear about how this timelier data is really making a difference for your patients and your organization. So the first example um, that we'll pull out of the list of how this data can help care coordination is the timely follow-up after some kind of acute exacerbation of a chronic condition. So in other words, event notification, but kind of on steroids. So obviously, you know, people who have some kind of exacerbation of their diabetes or their heart failure or whatever, and maybe hit the ED or hit the hospital or even hit the hospital in the sniff need need like to be caught by that skilled care team so they don't fall through the cracks um, uh, and have a readmission or even a worse outcome. So that clinically appropriate follow-up care, you know, can improve their outcomes, reduce readmissions, reduce costs. So what changes with BCDA? Now you can use claims data to complement other sources of information. And so I wanna get into that a little bit too, because people, a lot of uh, risk-bearing entities and uh, ACOs, et cetera, do have ADT feeds either coming from you know, their own internal EMR if, or if it's a big system or an HIE in the region or even some like super, you know, national HIE type systems are, are now coming into place, but they still don't capture everything. Um, or they may just be very focused on like hospital associated stuff. So anyway, um, so BCDA gives us like broader um, than HIEs and timelier than the usual claims. So for example, that heart failure admission or ED visit. Um, and then, you know, in the best case scenario, the care coordinator would get into their workflow notification within two to four days and be able to do that, uh, whether it's the regular um, transition care management process of doing the, the, you know, the phone outreach and the follow-up visit within seven or 14 days, or in the case of REACH, I understand it's actually one of the quality measures is timely follow-up after hospitalization, which you just, you know, it can be really difficult to get if you don't know that the hospitalization took place. Um, so with that, Jennifer, let's start with you. Um, just react to this and tell me how, uh, how Pearl is uh, thinking about this information for the clinicians. Sure, so um, I can outline you know, four different things that you know, are very meaningful from a care coordination standpoint. So at Pearl, our entire premise is around you know, which patients need your attention uh, today. So who, who has kind of an urgent need to be seen? And so of course, in order to do that, the, the more timely the data, the better. It's not always helpful to know about something 45 to 60 days after it happened, the sooner you know that something happened, or in fact, that something didn't happen that you expected to see happen. So that's kind of, you know, use cases one and two, and that could be anything from one of those acute events where, uh, you know, I should say Pearl's in, in, I think, 29 different states at the moment and expanding. And so we can't just go to one hospital or HIE to get our data. We are, you know, having to go much broader to get ADT. So the acute events, um, anything that we're missing from one of those aggregators, certainly important to know about an acute event, but also, you know, really uh, more broadly from that too, did you see a specialist and I didn't know you were seeing a specialist? Did you not see the specialist that I told you last time, you know, I referred you to last time and, and, and wanted you to go see? Um, so kind of, did something happen or did something not happen that I really want to have happen? Um, as well as just different patterns. Uh, are you starting to see a different PCP? Uh, have you been seeing uh, specialists at a really regular cadence or an increasing cadence? And that's where I really think you can use that timely data combined with data science to start identifying patterns. Because you mentioned reach the quality measures are pretty different than other programs. Uh, one of them is timely follow-up. Then there's all condition readmission. Both things that there's a trigger and then there's something you can do. And then there's unplanned admissions. Once it happens, uh, you know, that that is... Um, a negative outcome for your quality measure. So how do you know it's about to happen? Um, that's a really exciting space in value-based care for which timely data is very important. Are you starting to see some care patterns building up to an event? Um, so there's a lot of things beyond, I would say, traditional care coordination, um, you know, around transitional care management or, you know, something like that where it's always about an acute event or um, transfer to home from SNF, you know, all those kinds of things, all still 100% relevant, but there's so much more we can do 
when you combine the timeliness of the information with all of the advances you know going on right now in analytics and data science to use it to really you know prevent people from from having those acute events in the first place great john tell us great. about well, thank you yeah, thank you. And very much agree with everything Jennifer said. I, I think this notion of how are we aware of what's going on with the patients that we're caring for in, in the services they're gaining. And, and like um, Jennifer, operating across the Southeast region, we do have ADT feeds from some of our larger partners. We also um, partner and use and some of um, the, the other um, attendees may be using feeds from Bamboo Health and their patient ping or point click care solution, which again, have different levels of coverage in different regions, but locally HIEs and we're trying to bring all of that together. So this allows us the same sort of workflow and fills in those gaps. So very much agree with that notion. And I think it becomes the question of what do we then do with it? So one of the ideas is always asking and engaging with our clinical teams. If we're able to get you this information faster, what is the care team gonna do with it? So as I said, the upstream model is to embed and support primary care practices. So it may be scheduling that transitions of care visit if appropriate. It may be doing a reach out and a call visit or a video visit or meeting the patient at their primary care depending on the different um, severity or event, be it an ED visit, be it an inpatient admission, a SNF transfer, transfer home and coordinating home health with our nursing visits. So by doing this, this gives us a lot more insight to make sure we're getting all the right patients and it standardizes our workflow. So we don't ask our care teams to go look at three or four different sources or go look at the HIE. We bring it in and we actually partner with Innovacer for our workflows. So we're bringing this data in and the work we're doing um, with BCDA is to just make that another source into the same workflows. So we spend a lot of time of standardizing the workflows for our care teams and then our technology and data teams are, are aligning the data to that. So that is part of the work we're doing. So I think the, the BCDA feed allows us just a lot more insight, a lot more um, timely information. And I encourage everyone to think about how does it change the workflows? How does it give insight? And then how do you support it so your care teams don't see it as something else, but it's the natural flow of information. And then as, as Jennifer said, we expect over time to get better data science insights to say things we might not have noticed that then change the outcomes down the road how do we bring those into our workflow? So how do we ask the right data science questions or set up the right data science problems or analysis to start to gain that insight to say, can we reach out? What triggers or what I often like to say breadcrumbs are in all of that noise that we should be delivering up to our care teams and the providers and practices that we support? Yeah, fantastic. and. You know, in many, um, in some prior careers of mine, I've certainly been involved with sort of producing these claims-based, you know, 360 view of the patient, you know, but kind of in a static format and again, stale um, to some degree. And usually for a care manager, the most they can really do with that is sort of, you know, look at it to get a feeling for the patient, but it's not really gonna drive, you know, an action, it's not super actionable at the moment, but I can certainly see how even just looking at a list of not even like big events like hospitalizations, but even like the smaller events, as you mentioned, like they were seen in a specialist office or they did or didn't follow up for some labs that they were you know, scheduled to get. Um, that's super helpful to be able to know that for someone who's actively engaged in care management, as opposed to you know, sort of triggering an outreach for someone who maybe wasn't engaged before. Do you, do you guys want to react to that at all? Yeah, I was, um, you know, what it makes me think of is the fact that in, you know, kind of my past life in the very, you know, kind of beginning of, of you know, big, big data population health management, A, 
uh, as much as we um, talk about CCLFs being difficult, they were, you know, really amazing at that time to even get the insight across Absolutely. the the population. So I see this is just really building upon that. But in that time, and even today, when you want that more timely data, you often need to connect to the EMR. And it really depends. Are you running one EMR instance, which is going to be hard enough to get the data you want out of it and marry it with all your other data sources, as John was talking about? But this starts to not eliminate, but maybe reduce the need to be going into every EMR and getting every data element so that you can provide that more timely care. You know what the right next thing is to do. And, and you know, you're never going to get all the EMR data because it's living in a lot of different homes. Um, it's probably a whole other webinar we could talk about. Uh, getting clinical data, but I think BCDA, again, doesn't eliminate the need for clinical data, but it certainly uh, doesn't make us as reliant upon it in order to do the right things for patients. Because when we started consuming EMR feeds in my, my pop health product years and years ago, I mean, that was that was amazing, you know, that we would get that every night, but we had to take a huge batch feed, you know, from every single EMR and try to import that. So I just, I see this as really accelerating things we've all been trying hard to do. And with a whole team of mapping, easier. a whole mapping team, right? Working day and night. Yeah, oh, yeah. Every yeah. single feed mapping, was a whole new project. This instance call an HVA1C and that one. And, and so, you know, while there have been a lot of improvements, you know, in how we look at clinical data, uh, you know, it's still a very challenging and an inefficient path to be on. And this uh, does standardize it across these, at least reach for now and with the pre-adjudicated and hopefully more programs later to really add that benefit. So it's been really wonderful to watch that evolution from, you know, kind of 10, 10 plus years ago to where we are now. Yeah. Now, I agree very much, Jennifer. And that that was my experience as well when, when I was at Prisma Health and within what we called our Care Coordination Institute, we integrated over 100 EMRs across our footprint and um, very much appreciate and agree with you that the BCDA gives us, you know, not everything, but for especially for EMRs that are hard to integrate, we're still, I expect, going to see a lot of this hybrid work. And even though the advancements in EMR um, interoperability, standardization of things like CCDAs, which really aren't that standard many times. This gives us something that I think will give us the standard, add some lab values and some lab feeds, and you probably get 80, 90% of the way there very quickly and in a consistent way. So, so agree with that. And, and I think going back to um, the comments earlier about what do we do with these actions? So we're always seeking this concept of actionable insights. And so much of our work, um, either as technologists and data teams or our clinical teams have been give us a report. I, I wanna encourage us as we think about not just the BCDA feed coming in, but we shouldn't be in the business of building reports we should be in the business of finding the information that then can power our workflows. Because our care coordinators, their clinical expertise is around looking at that patient, patient, and as you said, looking at this whole view of the patient. Well, we need to take what we're learning here, feed it up to, and then the data science insights are, let's look at these 10 patients over these next 10. It isn't that we're, we're saying only these, but here's some prioritization based on what happened yesterday, this week, and otherwise, we're looking at these long lists of reports based on this very old data. So how do we change that? And I think this gives us the opportunity. So I encourage, yeah. as we move in this direction, to always be thinking about how are we using this in near real-time data science to then deliver actions to our care teams, not just reports for them to then have to weed yeah. through. And I think this is the sort of language around acceleration and transformation that, mm -hmm. that the BCDA feeds allow us to realize. Yeah, right. So we no <laughs> longer have to drive with Google Maps telling us the directions <laughs> based on where we were half an hour ago. Not yeah. that helpful, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, I mean, the, the whole kind of foundational principle of what we built at Pearl is all about which patients need action, kind of getting away from the report um, and, you know, all, all these different kind of uh, carry up lists and moving into which patients need attention today, um, exactly as you're saying, John. So we really do agree because, you know, you often hear we get so much data, we have to wade through everything to figure it out. Um, and also, you don't need to just tell me who my 
sickest, most expensive patients are, I already know. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's it's uh, it's who else needs your attention today who's already not showing up in the office and giving you calls. Uh, it's, it's everyone else who you may be not hearing from. Right. Zach, were you, did you have a comment? I mean, just last thing I was going to say was I, I think Jen's point of stopping an unplanned admission versus reacting to the, the already acute admission is probably the use case that excites me the most. I mean, I think, yeah, ADT feeds and things like patient ping have been helpful in that reactionary and planning follow-up, but the more we're able to use this BCDA feed to look at the specialist visit that occurs that means the PCP wasn't aware of, or the specialist visit that didn't occur that I already recommended, and following up on, on that and making sure that happens or, or doesn't happen and doesn't in turn lead to the unplanned admission. So it's more of a, you know, like John mentioned, a, a data science research use case that then is applied by the care managers. But, you know, if that's something that we're able to execute on through this, that'll be, you know, a win for, for everyone across the board, so. Okay, I know, I see we've got a bunch of questions coming in. So I wanna move us along quickly um, to the next use case, which I think will go a little faster because many of the same concepts here. So this one is also clinical and around gap closure. Um, and so as everyone knows, you know, we've got to close quality care gaps. Um, we want to look at things that happen annually or should happen annually, like an annual wellness visit for Medicare, like proper um, uh, risk capture through HCC or RAB coding. So um, having more timely information, obviously helpful. So uh, back to the lists and the workflow, um, annual wellness visit gaps. I mean, it was you know, when I when when annual wellness visits came out as a tool that was really a win-win, both in fee for service and also supporting pop health goals, it was always so frustrating trying to get some of my primary care physicians to adopt this uh, into their workflow because we'd give them lists and then they'd outreach to the patient, do all this work, bring them in, do the work, and you know, drop the bill and then not get paid because it turned out that. They had had it done by somebody else, you know, within the 364 days or whatever. So having that, you know, really timely information on who's had what, um, you know, AWVs are useful for many things, keeping attribution, doing the appropriate documentation, doing the preventive care stuff and all the other care coordination. So with BCDA, those gap lists you are two months ahead of what, or more timely, or even more, because by the time you get like CCLFs and do all the validation and processing and then put them into whatever your other tool is, I mean, it's often more than two months, right? Especially with claims run outs and all of that. So, um, so this use case um, gives you much more accurate information. Any comments on that? Uh, John, let's start with you. Sure, I, I appreciate um, your story about the AWV that wasn't billable. I, I expect many of the attendees, if they're working on the reporting side, they make these lists, they pass them out. Even by the time those get passed out, they might have even already had a scheduled visit within that PCP's office. And they're like, yeah. well, why are you telling me this? And we're always answering the question, oh, it must be a data issue. So I agree with this notion of how do we close not just the gaps of patient care, how do we close the gap on the timeliness of the data so we aren't sending the primary care practices, our care coordinators, the care teams, information that they're just gonna dig into and realize it's already been taken care of. So I think the notion of um, the speed of BCDA tied to what we were talking about, move away from these lists and how do we, and, and there are both EMRs as well as integrations, to deliver this most timely information at the point of care, into daily huddles, touching on the HCC um, documentation to be done at the point of care. So I think we need to think in the same way we were talking about is, um, you know, how do we get rid of these gaps, closure lists and reports and move to how does this information start to feed essentially daily huddle thinking so that the most timely information isn't just available to those moving in around, but it's available at the point of care. And I think that gives us an opportunity. We are PCMH thinking around daily huddles and prepping. This could be a huge benefit to it. And I think it's very valuable. So yes, and we are at the beginning of moving forward, I would argue. Jennifer? 
Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, and, and I would say the outcome of that is not only inefficiency, but it's when practices, physicians, they start losing trust in the data Absolutely. you're showing, um, not just for care gaps, but when the data is stale. And so when you uh, are essentially competing for their attention with everything else going on in their day and in their practice, which we all know, you know, is way too much and, and you know, seeing so many patients every day, you know, it, it's inefficient. And then they, yes, they stop trusting what you're showing. So then Zach, if we wanted to show the, you know, latest on our predictive uh, model of somebody who we think is due for uh, an admission based on a care pattern and now they don't trust me because I also showed them, you know, eight AWVs that they already completed. Um, I think that's the real, real shame of all of this is that it sort of, it, it starts to dilute the impact that we can make because, because we lose trust when we're trying to do the right thing, but, but our data hasn't caught up with us yet. Um, and the other use case I thought was kind of interesting is oftentimes the, the logic for who's in the denominator of a measure is a great indicator you know if you want who's my diabetic population okay well there it's not as easy <laughs> um to just you know go tag that you can use some of the logic in the denominator of those measures to be able to start cohorting and tagging populations so i think it's uh, not just for you know closing care gaps but also for some care coordination reasons mm -hmm. who is newly eligible who just got into the denominator based on something that just happened so i think there's you know ways that you can leverage even the care gap work and the accuracy of the care gap work to feed your care coordination workflows in that way too. Yeah, I, I mean, I certainly agree. I see it as a great way to identify patients that are eligible for like chronic condition management uh, services for remote monitoring services. You know, it kind of reminds me, I saw earlier this week or was it last week that, you know, CMS added remote monitoring codes to MSSP attribution for the 2024. So, you know, while AWB is something that you know, physicians are tracking to do once a year, remote monitoring might be something that you're tracking to do once a month. So it's, it's really important to bring up in your daily huddle, like John mentioned of, hey, we're, you know, two weeks left in the in the month or a week left in the month and 25% of these uh, patients haven't been in for their monthly CCM visit. And those are the things that are really stopping those unplanned admissions. So the more we can get people in those programs and track people through those programs is probably what's going to you know, prevent the the downstream outcomes that, that none of us want. Yeah, and probably just reiterating what you've all been saying is that the concept of targeting the rising risk population, you know, if they were rising risk three months ago, you probably like the horse has left the barn. So, <laughs> um, you know, having that timely information to run through, not just to know they saw a specialist or whatever, but whatever risk strat algorithm you use will be greatly enhanced by having uh, having the more timely information. Okay, let's move on to the a third use case, which is around financial forecasting. Um, so not so much on the clinical side, although certainly still can feed into like driving some clinical intervention. But uh, this is one where you could use episode triggers to project expected costs. Um, so, you know, knowing where you're trending, knowing that you have um, you know, a big influx of uh, cost about to hit you, um, even if it's just for your financial planning or trying to figure out where your performance is going to stand um, through the year without waiting for, you know, uh, nine months after the fact to know where you stand. Always, I've been in the hot seat with a board of how are we doing? And I go, well, I think, I'm not sure, maybe we're not, you know. So that's a really important conversation for a leader to be able to have with their governance and their positions. Um, you wanna be able to distribute your resources uh, appropriately. Again, maybe you can manage the downstream costs by intervening earlier. And again, you know, the, the episode triggering, it's not just saying like, oh, the person went to the ED, but it's saying, oh, early warning sign, you know, warning, warning, we have a lung cancer diagnosis or five new lung cancer diagnoses. And so even though those just happened, we kind of know from other data that we have access to that this is going to drive an additional $25,000 times five in cost over the next six months because those episodes um, you know, come with surgery, with radiation, with chemo, with a lot of ancillary testing and visits and specialty care and, and yada, yada. So, um, I mean, this is, 
you know, I was a little skeptical when I first heard this use case of like, okay, is this giving you a little more of a crystal ball in, in effect on how you're doing? So uh, what do you guys think? How are, how are, have you actually been doing this um, or is this in the works using the BCDA data? Jennifer, back to you. Yeah, I think of this, you know, there's the high level use case. And I was talking with our uh, head actuary prior to this saying, you know, hey, would you, how will you plan to use this? And John, you and I were talking about this the other day. And, you know, he kind of boiled it down that the forecast can become less of a forecast, right? Because you have a lot more timely data. So I think of it as kind of narrowing that cone of certainty, you know, as you are when you're earlier in the year, especially about how the organization is going to do and so i think there's kind of traditional financial forecasting the sooner you have it the better all the use cases you brought up uh, as well in terms of anticipating you know some of the the patterns that may come um, and and you know maybe not traditional financial forecasting but you know as a as a product person i think about having this data more that can i can i be testing the outcomes of what i'm trying to do faster so that you know that does obviously help with a financial forecast but it also does it validate or not validate a hypothesis that something that we were doing was going to work and have the intended effect from a financial standpoint from a clinical standpoint as well you know and as we really seek to kind of train and validate all of our models and do so you know rapidly and at scale this just really helps us understand what the actual impacts on the bottom line of everything that we're trying to do happens because right now I still face the claims lag and the you know CCLF lag of well I tried something a couple months ago and I'm I'm trying to validate it because if it's working I need to expand that and if it's not working I need to iterate on it or if it could be working better I need to to iterate uh, and it also allows us really more you know we've been talking at the patient level but you know at the practice level where are my hot spots where are my bright spots of practices doing well or not and the longer it takes to get that data the less time I have in a performance year to go coach and work with those practices or modify something that, that they or I are doing. So um, yes, I think it's got use cases kind of all the all, all of the different layers in terms of forecasting um, uh, the financial trends and financial outcomes and you know trying to turn turn things in a performance year. Uh, very hard to know uh, rapidly until now. Now, John, how's uh, upstream? Agree. At this? Yeah, I, I, I've got like three different threads of thoughts based on <laughs> where we're going here in, in a new idea, too, um, as okay. I was listening to Jennifer. Um, I, I think at one level, we are early in starting to think about how to use this information. So I, I, as you were kicking this, this use case off, I was thinking, this is a ask me in a year sort of question. <laughs> But I also live in the um, you know, CFO board question of what do we know? How do we know? Well, I can tell you what I know about three months ago, and then I'm gonna spend a lot of time telling you about IBNR and what I know and don't know about I IBNR. And then we're gonna have a conversation that in two to three months may look very different as well. So this idea of early financial forecasting is, is some work that we've been doing in the ideas that we've laid out here of, we're not gonna know exactly, but how does it support? And I, I like, um, Jennifer, what your actuary said about how does it help narrow that sort of scope or cone of the uncertainty? And, and I think that is how we should be leaning into this. Um, now, the actuaries want a lot more certainty and you know they often don't want to talk about what in actuarial speak is lag zero last month's claims as we just got them so how do we balance this of using the the data that's available get a little more insight and be able to look do some early financial reporting so that that's the path we're taking in doing work on I was also thinking about is we took both the example here as well as Jennifer as you were talking about some things that touch back on care coordination and I was thinking about how do we help and support our providers in um, pathways so when we learn about a no, new diagnosis be it an oncology diagnosis that may have a pathway or alternative pathways um, areas where there may be early diagnosis that may have some alternatives and how do we support patients, their care teams, the specialists, and then their primary care providers to 
make sure that we're informing about the pathways and what those outcomes are. And our teams work closely with our provider community. And I hadn't thought about how this could be an early indication about patient choice and what that might mean as well. So thinking about how all of this ties together, coordination, our timely data, and then early financial forecasting or looks, I, I think really drives us to how do we transform not just the care, but how we're operating these value-based programs. And I think there's a lot of exciting opportunity and information here that you know we are just, I, I think I said this earlier, at the beginning of this journey as well. Okay, I mean, this, fantastic. Yeah, go ahead, Zach, go ahead. I was just gonna say, this is an analytic that you can, as, as John said, you can dive really deep on. You don't ask me in a year, we'll still have another year planned of, of things that we wanna do here. But when predicting a, a kind of like downstream episode cost, um, you can apply patient risk up to that point. You can apply the, the doctor that's assigned uh, to that case based on their previous experience. Um, and you can really like use previous experience to determine what type of episodes have huge variability, right? And maybe those are the ones that you want to put more care plans on versus the ones that you know have very little variability and you're and you're not going to affect affect. I, I, I like I that. A, a, I detect an AI coming into here somewhere <laughs> around pattern recognition and yeah. uh, you know early signal. So um, okay. I want to first of all say I'm coming to you from Southern Vermont, where you might have seen uh, we were you might have seen my own backyard video, which hit the global newswire, and I'm having a little instability of my connection. So if I drop out, um, the discussion will continue, and I know that there you know we'll still get to your questions. But before we get to questions, um, let can I just touch on Zach could, on the technical side? Can you? Like, I don't know what an API is. I know what CCLFs are, but you know, some people may or may not know yes. what Snowflake is, but just like, how does this work technically and where can people go um, to learn more about it and can, can Care Journey help with that? Yeah, yeah, so so CMS has a website based on, on BCDA specifically. It tells you kind of like a blanket statement of how to get started, how to access the API with your actual credentials or access it with uh, kind of fake synthetic credentials, but um, it, it, it isn't as trivial as, as CMS may make it seem on the website, right? So, you know, once you- I can't push in, a button? <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet, unfortunately. So, you know, once you put in basically your username and password, you're able to down, download uh, a JSON, actually an ND JSON to get really particular, but um, basically something that you need to unnest and then normalize into uh, a, a data model that you can then use downstream. Um, so, you know, something that, you know, we take care of on the care journey side is, is doing just that, um, basically pulling it, uh, undoing the JSON and putting it in where a row of data is like a claim line. So you see like patient date, CPT code, cost, all of that nature that we can then do downstream analytics with. Um, so, so definitely something Care Journey can can help with, um, as well as those downstream analytics. Um, and and we'll mention briefly that, that we are offering a a brief free trial of of that type of service. So if you're interested in in learning more, please mention in the in the chat or or the questions uh, or follow up with us after. Um, very ha be happy to talk. Um, really want to get more uh, more people using using this data and unlocking the insights that John and Jennifer mentioned throughout throughout this. Yeah. Okay, we have a ton of questions coming in. So uh, let's see. First question, which I will, again, if you have questions, please put them in the question, not the chat, but the question uh, box. Um, so we know CMS um, is offering this, but most ACOs and other entities take care of far more people than just like the MSSP or REACH program. So Zach, can you comment and then any other comments on like who, it's it's really hard to invest in a resource just for one payer and sure. put it into workflow for just one payer. So what's the answer? Yeah, so um, unfortunately, as of now, uh, no payers are required to provide a similar type API until 2026. So it still is promising that they will be required in 2026 and that will be available. Uh, but very few thus far have uh, actually done so and made that available. Um, one is Humana, though, so you know that's that's an example of someone who who has an API that you can pull those MA patients and get similar type insights that we're seeing on BCDA. 
Um, at Care Journey, we you know we do as you saw from the first slide, we have uh, a fair amount of payer clients. We're encouraging all of them to beat that 2026 deadline, as we know it's very important for these physicians to to get access to this information on uh, a much higher percentage of their panel than maybe just fee for service. Right? You know, we we know some of our organizations have large fee for service panel, but some of the organizations we work with are opposite. Right? It might be 90% MA. Um, so, you know, we're constantly encouraging en encouraging that to, to move forward more quickly, but uh, for now it is is kind of few and far between on the, on the payer side. Yeah, so can, have, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree completely with Zach if that's the state uh, that we're in. And, and at the same time, I would encourage um, people that are working in these spaces to think about this is the goal is to get this to your frontline workflow, either technology speaking, the engine that's driving what your clinical or care teams are doing. So I, I think about how do you set up your infrastructure, whatever that means to you, to be able to make use of and assume that we're going to get these feeds over time and that we're plugging in and you know we work with Care Journey so that we're not doing what Zach explained, the JSON unpacking, et cetera. That's a service. But what we do with that inside in um Catherine, you mentioned Snowflake. So we bring that into our Snowflake environment where we then develop the logic and the data science around that. And we're excited working with Care Journey. We're actually moving that BCDA data directly from Snowflake to Snowflake instance. So using private data exchange with Snowflake. And by emphasizing or focusing on the workflow, the technology is going to always change at what I would call that, that front end. And even if you can get payer data a little more slowly, but push it through the same process, then your care teams are seeing the same work. And they may understand that, hey, this MA data from this payer is a little slower, not as fast, but we've prepared for the future. And I think that's how I would encourage people that are architecting, thinking about using BCDA and other feeds to think about a world that looks like that. Absolutely. So you can make, the, you can make okay. the experience the same, even though the data feeding it uh, might be different, which will always be the case, of, you know, the more you expand in the world of BBC. So totally agree with uh, John's point of view there. So one clarifying question we have here, um, does the BCDA feed include two to four day claims data for post-acute intervention? And I think my understanding is like any claim that's submitted to CMS for anything is going to come through, whether it's a lab test or uh, sniff stay or so the, the only latency is between the provider and actually dropping the claim and then you get it then it comes out within two to four days for pre-adjudicated for reach and post-adjudicated is up to 14. Is that correct Zach? Did I, did I learn yeah, it from you right? The only clarification I would make is is uh, the part D data, uh, D is in dog, uh, unfortunately is not available in the pre-adjudicated resource so it's still available in the adjudicated resource to get those prescription claims, I think because that runs through in a different adjudication process than uh, professional and institutional claims, but SNF claims and post-acute claims via institutional should come in the pre-adjudicated resource. Yeah, and, yeah. And, I, and I wonder if there's a question cleared. I think there are some groups that sort of bill monthly versus after events and otherwise, and I know those often lag in the CCLFs as well, and I would expect the same for the same reasons here as well. Yeah, that's the IBNR basically is still going to have an effect. So uh, we had a great editorial comment, not really a question, but uh, it ties in, John, I think to what actually what you were all saying. So EHR vendors like Epic still use CCLF files and they use it primarily for reporting and ACO metrics. It will be, I hope Epic, are you listening? And EHR vendors, are you listening? It will be important for EHR vendors to move to BCDA. Epic needs to combine this with their payer platform functionality, which they currently offer with a few payers. So, uh, you know, we, we don't have to, uh, does, does anyone want to comment on that other than amen? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's yeah. Another, oh, I was go just ahead. Gonna say. Yeah, it's just another way to get it into the point of care, ideally, right? So, you know, if they're able to surface it through their Healthy Planet application or something like that, uh, that's going to reach a lot of people, uh, which would, uh, you know, a lot of physicians specifically. So, uh, yeah, double click on, uh, yes, Hope Epic is listening as well. Yeah, I think yeah. the goal is this should be the new standard. And anybody who's touching the space, building in the space, you know, 
will want to, to kind of be there, whether it's a pop health platform, an EHR enablement companies like ours. Uh, you know, I think the, the collective goal we should all have is this becomes the new standard for how we do pop health. Yeah, and then there's another question uh, that gets into integrating the data directly into the EMR for gap closures, et cetera. Again, I'm not, you know, it's nice that it's faster, but if you haven't been able to integrate insights from CCLF into your EHR and have it adopted by your care teams, like even bigger challenge, um, I'm not sure it will be any different for BCDA um, other than like on the technical back end, correct? Yeah, I, I think there may be a subtlety and this gets to Jennifer, the way you were talking about what we've done with EMRs histi historically and what we may do. There may be a middle ground here because taking a whole set of CCLFs and bringing them in every month, the volume into an EMR and then making meaning out of them, we may be able to see a switch where the BCDA feeds can be used to gain some insight. So just the, what are the gaps that have been closed? Some of those key things we care about, and I could see a future where that is actually integrated a lot more timely, and you don't have to go through all the financial analysis of the claims. So there may be some middle grounds that actually let us get there faster. And I don't know exactly what they look like, but I think there's an enablement here that is different than saying the weight of processing I think um, whoever said the you know various files that have to come together and you've got to know how to process them. I think you may be able to see a way to make insight use at the EMR level more simply if we focus on some use cases. And you know I, I'm now thinking about what that looks like. So. Yeah, I think you could make it much richer than only hair gaps or only coding yeah. suggestions. Yeah. Those are important. Those are part of your metrics. You know, very important to have those particularly in the visit because that's where the action and the assessment needs to happen. But there's a whole world of richer insights that especially yeah, with more timely data we could. And, you know, I think it keeps building up that trust that we were talking about as well. Um, but, you know, just a, a viewpoint there too is I think a lot of the value and a lot of the things that we can do in terms of the workflows we're talking about, they don't always happen inside that visit. Uh, so it's important to know what needs to go in the visit and make that more and more trustworthy, uh, more and more relevant to that uh, that care provider, but then also recognize a lot of things that we we do in this world of value-based care happen outside of that kind of the confines of, of a billable visit, if you will. Uh, so, so I think it's always important to keep that in mind, but certainly not the only way that, that you want to be delivering kind of the right next steps. Okay, I think we have time for one more quick question. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but John, you had mentioned, you know, you look at both the HIE ADT feeds that you get and then fill in the gaps with um, with BCDA. Or do any of you have a sense of like, what's the proportion there? Is it 50-50 or is the BCDA just like really around the fringe or is it the other way around? I, I think we're going to learn, again, that's another ask me in a year. Um, I think it's going to be different in different markets as well. So yeah. we're, you know, we serve the, the um, several states in the Southeast and in some places we have plenty of coverage either through existing ADT partners, through um, our, our work with Bamboo Health or Point Click Clear, but we don't have full coverage. So I think it's going to be different. And what we're going to do is be studying this and we may decide, oh, this is adequate for these use cases or we need this. You know, like Jennifer said about onboarding EMRs, when we come in with a large health system partner, onboarding their ADT feeds directly is one of the steps. If we can skip that step, we're able to implement a lot faster as well. So I think it's a, we're going to see a transition and I don't think I know what it looks like yet, but we'll be studying that as we go to say, you know, where is the information? How fast are we getting it? And what is the most efficient? We may also take, come into a market, say BCDA helps us move into a market, work with providers in that market, and we still may do the other ones, but they won't be as urgent. So the implementation can be slower. So thinking about all those options, and, and I think a year, a year down the road, I'll have a lot more insight into what worked and didn't work as well. Yeah. 
So uh, we're coming up on time here. So I'll put you all on the spot and say if for everyone who's on the webinar who is not already an adopter, um, do you, we need to, should they be adopting now or is this something that you can wait and see? One word answer. John. <laughs> well, I have many words. It depends. And I think it depends how mature your current infrastructure is. Okay, Jennifer. I would say now and don't don't feel like you have to do it all at once. You can pick the things that are most important to you and, and focus on how to incorporate that into your infrastructure. Okay. And now Zach, I'm going to defer to Garrett here because I know we're at the top of the hour. Thank you all for joining. Garrett, any closing words? There are a few other questions that have come in as well. Um, we'll try to get to them if we can uh, in person. <laughs> Great. Well, hey, thank you all so much. And I know we do have a lot of questions, but don't worry. Uh, we will get to your question, even if we didn't get to it today. Someone will reach out to you through email afterwards and answer that question for you. So go ahead and ask it now, even if you have one as we're wrapping up. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, and uh, first of all, I want to apologize if anyone had any connectivity issues or getting on to the to the webinar today. There was some some sort of technical issue um, that I think got resolved, but I apologize if you had trouble getting on. But thank you for for uh, persevering and joining us. We're glad to have you. Uh, as we're concluding here, I wanted to encourage you to head over to bbcexhibithall.com and check out the Care Journey exhibit booth uh, there. There's a uh, virtual uh, exhibit booth that has a lot of resources. It's kind of a snapshot of what they're doing in the value-based care space uh, and beyond. A lot of really neat things and resources there. Uh, and then uh, also, if you would like to reach out to uh, Care Journey directly. Their email is is here on the slide, and you can feel free to reach out to them to be put in touch with any of our speakers, or uh, or feel free to reach out to me as well, and I'm happy to facilitate an introduction for you. Um, thank you all so much again for joining us today. Very glad to have you, uh, and we will be in touch for the next webinar. Hopefully, you join us then. Have a great day. Thank Thanks you all. So much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys.